So now we're going to start talking about the antihyperlipidemic agents. So currently six classes of antihyperlipidemic drugs are available. Each class has its own mechanism for lowering lipid levels and somewhat unique indications. The 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarol coenzyme A, or HMG-CoA, reductase inhibitors, or the SATINs, are indicated for patients with primary hypercholesteremia. That is, LDL is the primary lipid elevation with minor elevations of in the triglycerides. Fibric acid derivatives are indicated for reducing the risk that CHD may develop in patients with a history of CHD who have low HDL cholesterol levels and elevated triglyceride levels. They are also indicated for adults with marked hypertriglyceride triglyceride levels who are at risk of pancreatitis and who have not responded adequately to dietary therapy. Bile acid sequence are indicated as adjunctive therapy to diet for reducing LDL cholesterol in patients with primary hypercholesteremia. Niacin is indicated for patients with hyperlipidemia, all forms of elevated total cholesterol or triglycerides, who respond inadequately to dietary therapy. Selective cholesterol absorption inhibitors used as monotherapy or in combination with statins for the reduction in elevated total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and in patients who, who, with primary hypercholesteremia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids are indicated as an adjunct to diet to reduce very high, greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter triglyceride levels in adult patients. I'm sorry, um, these are best used um, for patients who LDL is high and um, with primary hypercholesteremia. Niacin um, is believed to act on a hormone-sensitive lipase. This leads to the inhibition of release of free fatty acids from the adipose tissue, um, the inhibition of of um, the free release of fatty acids leads to a reduced free fatty acid transport to the liver and therefore decreases the synthesis of VLDLs. This decrease in VLDLs in turn causes a reduction in LDLs. The increase in the lipoprotein lipase activity produced by nicotinic acid is believed to increase the rate of chlomicron triglyceride removal from the plasma. The mechanism underlying the increase in LDL is thought to result from reduced lipid transfer of cholesterol from LDL to VDL, VLDL and by delayed HDL clearance. So again, in summary, niacin is, is for patients with all forms of elevated total cholesterol or triglycerides who do not respond to diet therapy alone. There um, are also selective cholesterol absorption inhibitors. They're known to localize in the intestinal wall where it's converted to its active glucuronide metabolite. It appears to act on the blush, brush border of the intestinal epithelial cells, where it selectively inhibits the absorption of cholesterol from dietary and, and biliary sources. Reduced cholesterol absorption results in a decrease in the delivery of cholesterol to the liver. Less cholesterol is thus available in hepatic stores, allowing more cholesterol to be cleared from the blood. It does not affect the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins or triglycerides the benefit over bile acid sequentrants. Um, these circulate intrahepatically, repeatedly delivering the agent back to the intestine and reducing systemic absorption. Clinical benefit is questionable. 
modifying chemicals which serve as surrogate markers for actual bad outcomes via different pharmacologic mechanisms unfortunately does not allow always result in clinical benefit that is meaningful to patients. So again, these drugs are used in monotherapy or in combination with the statins the re for the reduction of uh, total triglycerides, LDLs, and lipoprotein B. The omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids mainly um, are essential nutrients. Lovaza is a highly concentrated combination of esters of EPA and DHA. The primary mechanism of action is reduction, approximately 45% in the hepatic production of triglycerides, which reduces production of LD VLDL. HDL is largely unaffected and LDL may increase. Adverse events are usually mild and include erectation, dys dyspnea, and taste perversion. So these are adjunct to diet to reduce very high triglyceride levels in adults. Again, you're not responsible for the pathways of how these um, work, but you should be familiar. The mechanism of action um, of the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors there are the m these are the most common drugs used in to treat patients with hyperlipidemia, and they're well tolerated by many patients and are highly um, useful in lowering LDL levels. Adverse effects are similar for all seven agents. Many of the reports on adverse effects suggest that they are seen in as minor um, by providers, and the patient feels that because of this, they're not always addressed by healthcare providers, even if the patient's quality of life is impacted. However, a switch from one drug to another may be advisable if adverse reactions occur. The onset of activity is evident within two weeks of starting the drug, with maximal lipoprotein changes at four to six weeks after um, initiation of the medication. Serum um, lipoprotein concentrations typically return to baseline values within a similar period after the drug is discontinued. In most patients, it's suggested to use a dosage of satin, statins significant to achieve at least 30 to 40 percent reduction in LDL levels. Uh, for example, aterostatin, 10 milligrams per day, simvastatin, 20 to 40 milligrams per day. Hepatotoxicity and muscle Toxicity are the two primary adverse effects of greatest concerns with the statin drugs. All patients who start statins should be instructed to report immediately episodes of muscle discomfort or weakness or brown urine. Um, laboratory measurements of AST or ALT and CK levels um, should be performed. At clinically relevant dosages, uh, the LDL lowering potential of the six drugs in this class can be roughly ranked in, um, in the following order. Rosavistatin is greater than aturvastatin, which is greater than simvastatin, which is um, equal to lovastatin, which is greater than pit pitavastatin, um, and so on. Some drugs do more than um, lower cholesterol. Some of the statins may be correlated with overall lower mortality in patients who um, take them, particularly in the reduction of death from infection and respiratory illness. Statins may also reduce major adverse cardiovascular episodes in both men and women. They may also lower the risk of second stroke in young adults and have been implicated in producing tendinitis and even tendon rupture, particularly in the patients with metabolic disorders, um, those who, who exert themselves physically throughout the day, and patients uh, taking other drugs that might increase the toxicity of statins, such as steroids or antibiotics like the fluoroquinolones. So the bile acid uh, sequentrants and folic acid, uh, fibric acid, um, you s with these medications, you see a decline in the intracellular cholesterol concentration. Um, it accelerates 
the HMG-CoA reductase activity, and then up regulation of LDL cell surface receptors. This results in an increased intracellular cholesterol concentrations for conversion into bile acids. Thus, they increase the catabolism of LDL by the liver. Both phenofibrate and glufibrazole are highly effective in decreasing triglycerides and, and increasing HDLs. They are not effective in lowering LDL levels. They are generally well tolerated but can cause hepatotoxicity and cholelithiasis. The maximum effect of gemfibrazole gem is observed within four to five weeks. Generic form is available and typically costs less. Um, phenofibrate causes a decrease in cholesterol and triglyceride levels and elevation of LDL. Uric acid levels may also be decreased in some patients receiving phenofibrate because of the uric activity observed within the drug. So this might be a useful drug for using uh, patients who have high triglyceride levels as well as gout. Um, a recent meta-analyst evaluated the effect of fibrates on cardiovascular outcomes. Fibrates produced a modest 10% relative risk reduction in major cardiovascular events, but had no effect on lowering stroke or cardiovascular mortality. Therapy with either a statin or a fibrate protects against the development of nerve damage in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Investigators showed that the treatment with statins and fibrates reduced the relative risk of developing peripheral neuropathy by 35 to 48% among diabetic patients um, during a five-year follow-up. The rate of absolute risk reduction is far less successful. The bile acids, acid sequentrants, um, the three bile acids um, are equally um, effective. Patient acceptance is a matter of, of concern because of the gastrointestinal adverse effects such as constipation, bloating, and nausea. Selection between agents should be based on cost and um, the taste. Questrin light um, should be used before Crestrin, which contains sucrose and provides unneeded calories for many patients, um, especially diabetic patients who are obese. Colvis, um, there are other forms that are available in tablet. Um, for patients who dislike inconvenience and the taste associated with the powdered resin. The LDL concentrations begin to decline within a few days of, um, with maximum effect observed in one month. Triglycerides and the VLDL concentrations rise initially in treatment and then tend to return to baseline levels after one month. Patients who have pre-existing elevations in triglycerides may experience a greater and more sustained increase in triglyceride levels. HDL levels are not predictably altered with bile acid sequentrants. We also need to look at the um, nicotinic acid, niacin or niacin. Niacin is one of the most effective antihyperlipidemic agents in terms of lowering triglycerides and increasing LD HDL. It's similar in efficacy to the bile acids in lowering LDL. The main limitation of niacin, however, um, is the adverse effect of flushing, although tolerance to this phenomenon generally occurs with continuous use. Flushing occurs shortly after ingestion and can be blunted with aspirin 30 minutes before. A slow escalation of niacin dosage over three to four weeks um, usually is helpful. Extended release niacin products cause less flushing and immediate release tablets than the immediate release tablets and usually are preferred because of the better tolerability. Niacin can cause hyperglycemia and hyperuricemia. Um, the uh, study recently showed that adding niacin to statin therapy in patients with established cardiovascular disease did not really result in additional lowering of cardiovascular event rates. 
over statin monotherapy um, alone and may even have introduced additional risks. So more is not better. Um, for the cholesterol abs selective cholesterol absorption in inhibitor inhibitors, um, azetabide is the only available agent in this drug class. When compared to uh, the placebo, it's been shown to decrease intestinal cholesterol absorption by 50%. As monotherapy, it can decrease LDL, increase HDL, and decrease triglycerides. When used in combination with a low-dose statin, an additional 18% reduction in LDL cholesterol has been seen when compared to statin therapy alone. Reduction in LDL cholesterol may be seen as early as two weeks um, following the initiation. And one very important point to consider is that the clinical benefit is not supported by the evidence. It's a fairly new class of drugs, again localizes in the intestinal wall and converts to its active glucuronide metabolite. Also have the fish oil supplements, uh, supplements um, the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, Lovasa is the only fish oil supplement that has been approved by the FDA. Other brands of fish oil supplements are sold over the counter, but their content of purity is not regulated by FDA. In studies of patients with recent MIs, it significantly reduced total mortality and sudden cardiac death. However, studies involving patients with chronic um, CHD, the result of using fish oil supplements are equivocal, and some concern has arisen about worsened cardiovascular outcomes. No evidence from high-quality trials suggests that fish oil supplements decrease cardiovascular diseases in the general population. Um, and finally, combination therapy. The treatment of more than one drug may be required to keep lipoprotein levels within the appropriate age, uh, range, but combination treatment also contributes to an increased risk of adverse events. Combining statins with a fibric acid derivative increases the risk of rhabdomyolysis. Phenofibrate is typically the preferred fibrate if one is adding it to an existing statin therapy. That is, phenofibrate has a lower risk of rhabdomyolysis than the others when used in combination with statin therapies. Statins, fibric acid derivatives, and niacin are known to cause hepatotoxicity, um, and adverse effects risks is additive when the drugs are used together. So for monitoring, um, all the medications, lipid pro profiles should be performed to obtain baseline levels and repeated um, at four to six weeks, and then again at three months to assess the response of therapy after it's been initiated. For long-term monitor, for long-term monitoring um, of col total cholesterol can be measured at follow-up visits, and a lipoprotein profile and LDL estimation can be performed annually. Liver function tests should be performed at baseline 12 weeks after initiation of therapy or increasing of dosages and periodically thereafter, either annually or semi-annually. This applies to the fibrates, statins, and niacin. Statins, fibric, and natinic acid, um, you need to frequently ask the patient about myalgias and check the CPK if if these are present. Otherwise, routine monitoring of CPK is probably not necessary. If niacin or fibric acid derivatives are used in any combination, you need to monitor the LFTs and CPKs more frequently. This is necessary because of the concerns about the uh, additive risk of hepatotoxicity and myopathy. New research has suggested that people who use statins have more than twice the risk of developing age-related cataracts um, than non-users, while people with type 2 diabetes who use statins are, are even greater risks. These patients need um, ophthalmic 
um, evaluations uh, while on the medication. Um, they also can cause memory loss and amne amnesia. The statins um, need to uh, monitor the LFTs at baseline. Um, in 2012, the FDA removed liver monitoring requirements of the drug, um, so they're not recommended for routine monitor monitoring of statins um, because of the serious liver injury with statins is rare. Less than 1% of patients typically show LFT results greater than three times the upper limit of normal during therapy. Although values greater than three times the upper limit of normal have occurred in 2 to 3% of the patients on high dose statin therapy, such as atorvastatin at 80 milligrams per day. Um, isolated ALT and AST elevation in the absence of increased bilirubin levels has not been linked to liver in injury while on these medications. Patients um, need to be told to notify their provider immediately if they have unusual fatigue, weakness, loss of appetite, upper belly pain, dark colored urine, or yellowing of the skin or whites of the eyes. Statins now are mandated to carry a black box warning um, advocating to watch for patients developing diabetes, confusion, and memory loss. Um, protease inhibitors and statins taken together may raise the blood levels of statins and increase the risk of muscle injury. These myopathies or rhabdomyolysis can damage the kidneys and leave, lead to kidney failure, which can be fatal. Manufacturers of both the HIV protease inhibitors and the affected statins have been updated to contain this information to show dosing recommendations for those statins that may safely be co-administered with HIV or HCVC protease inhibitors. For the bile acids, you need to uh, perform s complete blood counts and liver function tests at least every three months during the first year and periodically after. For patients receiving other drugs, drugs monitor for a decreased pharmacological response um, or drug level of these medications while bio, bile acid resins are initiated. This is especially um, necessary for patients uh, receiving digoxin, uh, coumadin, levothyroxine, or thiazide diuretics, as the bile acid resins will decrease absorption of these drugs if taking at the same time. Niacin, nice, uh, niacin needs to be monitored as well. Um, repeat the lipid profile at four to six weeks after the dosage of 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams per day um, is reached, and then perhaps again at three months to access, access, assess, assess for response. For long-term monitoring, total cholesterol can be obtained at most follow-up visits. A lipoprotein profile and LDL estimate can be performed annually. Um, so for patient uh, variables, for geriatric patients, in general, antihyperlipidemics may achieve maximum cholesterol reductions in elderly at somewhat smaller doses than those required in younger patients. Uh, significant pharmacokinetic alterations in the elderly do not appear to be a major concern with the available hyperlipidemics. A common deliver, dilemma involves deciding how aggressively you should treat hyperlipidemia in the elderly. Satin therapy does not pose an increased safety risk for older patients with hypercholesteremia or established cardiovascular disease. Drug therapy is warranted for patients 65 to 75 years of age because of the association with hypercholesterolemia and um, CHD. This relationship is inverted after the age of 80. Those without CHD um, but with several risk factors and markedly elevated LDL also should be s strongly considered for drug therapy. No data is available on patients older than age 75, and lipid-lowering therapy is controversial. For patients who are currently on therapy, it should be continued for secondary prevention. 
the continued use for primary prevention is highly uncertain. And the given fact that the statins are associated with multiple side effects that gravely affect the uh, quality of life, um, reconsideration of the need for a statin needs to be taken with the elderly patients. Before um, treatment is begun in individuals older than 75, a number of um, factors other than chronological age must be considered, um, such as quality of life, lifespan limitations, comorbid conditions, and psychologic age. Although benefits of lipid-lowering lower, therapy in the middle age are well accepted, the CHD risk reduction associated with treatment in the elderly older than 70 years is less certain and not supported by the current available evidence. When these factors are taken into consideration, elderly patients with established CHD and elevated LDL cholesterol, cholesterol ordinarily should be considered for treatment, but the principles of shared decision making should be followed. New research um, suggests that there's a small but statistically significant increase in aggression on average among people on statins, particularly women and the elderly. For pediatric patients, although the literature on the use of these medications in children is growing, there is little or no data to support the treatment of the risk factor in children. Managing hypercholesteremia in children 10 to 17 years of age primarily involves dietary and lifestyle changes. Cholesterium and the statins are FDA approved for managing hy hypercholesteremia in children, yet they are infrequently used. If pharmacotherapy is recommend, recommended, statins have been recommended as a drug of choice in children uh, with familial hypercholesteremia. It's advised that the hyperlipidemics should be prescribed to children only under supervision of lipid specialists with no ties to the pharmaceutical industry. For pregnant and lactating women, triglyceride and cholesterol levels increase during pregnancy, but the increase usually is not considered clinically significant. Drug therapy for hyperlipidemia should be discontinued during pregnancy, um, and the safety of lipid-lowering drugs in pregnant women has not been established. Therapy with the statins is contraindicated during pregnancy, as well as lactation. For patients with severe forms of hyperlipidemia, consultation with a lipid specialist should be considered. Um, the colvastelum is a category B. Uh, category C includes a phenofibrate, uh, glymphobazole, niacin, cholesterol. Um, category X is all strains of the Artervastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, prevastatin, simvastatin, um, and most of the statins. No fetal harm is expected with a cholestramine um, if given in recommended dosage, although treatment may interfere with the absorption of fat soluble vitamins. Um, patient education with these drugs. For all medications, um, patients should report any signs or symptoms of liver dysfunction. For the statins, um, they should, uh, patients should be informed to promptly report any muscle pain, tenderness, or weakness that's unexplained, particularly if fever is present. Um, and these drugs may also occasionally cause photosensitivity. For the bile acids, um, the powders can be blended and stored um, with any consumable liquid. A mixture of the powders with fruit juice tends to be more palatable than a mixture of them with water. Um, the powders can be mixed with hot food but should not be cooked. The resins often interfere with absorption of other drugs and other medications should be taken one hour before and three to four hours after. Uh, for the nicotinic acid, um, facial and upper extremity flushing commonly occurs in patients. Um, paritis, warm sensations, and tingling may also occur. These adverse effects tend to diminish in severity with continued use. Um, so, and avoiding taking niacin with hot fluids be, um, may help decrease the flushing um, episodes. 
the hot fluids may worsen flushing e episodes. If episodes uh, become very bothersome, aspirin can be given 81 to 325 milligrams. Um, may, it may blunt the effect if given 30 minutes before uh, the niacin is ingested. So let's move on um, to the diuretics. These are very common in practice. There are four major subclasses of the diuretics, the thiazides, the loop, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and protein-sparing diuretics. Um, they act by decreasing sodium reabsorption at different sites along the nephron. The four classes differ in terms of the specific site of action in the nephron, um, the ability to augment urinary losses of sodium, sodium and water is useful in the treatment um, for hypertension, heart failure, renal failure, and cirrhosis. A large number of thiazide diuretics are available. Um, only the five most common used are uh, um, talked about here. The use of potassium supplementation um, is necessary with some of these diuretics. And um, all of the diuretics are now available in generic forms. So what are the indications? Um, they're indicated for use in hypertension, congestive heart failure, renal failure, and cirrhosis. Mechanism of action. The three major classes, um, excluding combination therapy, are thiazide, loop, and potassium sparing um, diuretics. These are generally distinguished at the point where they impair sodium reabsorption within the renal tubule. Thiazide type diuretics work at both the distal tubule and the connecting segment, and perhaps in the early cortical collecting tubule. Loop diuretics, the most potent, act in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Potassium sparing diuretics work in the aldosterone sensitive principal cells in the cortical collecting tubules. The ability of each type of diuretic to increase urinary sodium excretion depends on two factors, the amount of sodium reabsorbed at its site of action and the ability of more distal sites to reclaim that sodium. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors act on the proximal tubule, where up to 65% of sodium is normally reabsorbed. However, these drugs have limited clinical usefulness as diuretics um, because the sodium lost at this site is effectively reclaimed at more distal sites along the nephron. Loop diuretics act in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, where 25% of the sodium is normally reclaimed. Thiazide diuretics act on the distal tubule where 3 to 5 percent of the sodium is reclaimed. The collecting duct is the site of action of potassium sparing diuretics. Normally only 1 to 2 percent of the sodium is reabsorbed at that site. These drugs, as their group name implies, limit urinary losses of potassium. So let's take a look at the thiazide diuretics. In all, 3 to 5 percent of filtered sodium is reabsorbed in the distal tubule. This reabsorption occurs uh, via the sodium chloride co-transporter that is inhibited by thiazide, di thiazide diuretics. The therapeutic effect of this class of diuretics is particularly blunted by the reabsorption of sodium that takes place distally in the cortical collecting tubules. Thus, thiazide-type diuretics are less effective in the treatment of edema, where a large amount of fluid loss is the goal of therapy. In the treatment of patients with hypertension, however, these drugs are particularly effective because of marked fluid loss is neither necessary nor desirable. The mechanisms that underlie the efficacy of thiazides in the treatment of hypertension are not completely known. Volume lo loss um, is likely to play an important role, however. Um, during long-term therapy, however, these drugs may act to decrease peripheral resistance, vascular resistance. The distal renal tubule is also the primary site of calcium reabsorption. The thiazides act to enhance calcium absorption and lessen excretion. 
This effect is beneficial in the treatment of patients with chronic kidney stones that arise from excessive calcium excretion. Well, what about um, the loop diuretics? 20% um, of filtered sodium is reabsorbed in the loop of Henle. A co-transporter in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and in the macular densa cells of the early distal tubule moves one molecule of sodium and potassium and two molecules of chloride from the tubular lumen into the tubular epithelial cells. Most reabsorbed potassium then moves back into the cell, into the tubular lumen, via the potassium channels. Loop diuretics inhibits this co-transporter and are able to extract up to 25% of the filtered sodium. Um, because they work at the area of the loop of Henle, thus their name, loop diuretics. Ototoxicity um, caused by intravenous loop diuretic therapy is thought to be related to the inhibition of the co-transporter in the inner ear. Loop diuretics um, promote the excretion of calcium, and this occurs passively as a result of sodium reabsorption inhibition. Um, this is clinically relevant um, in that the loop diuretics and saline hydration are the treatments of choice in cases of hypercalcemia. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, um, approximately 50 to 75 percent of filtered sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. However, the diuretic response is generally weak because most filtered sodium is reclaimed by both the loop of Henle and the distal nephron. An important sodium transport pathway at this site is the sodium hydrogen exchanger that is located in the luminal membrane of the proximal tubular cells. An important factor in maintenance of the sodium hi um, hydrogen exchange is the removal of hydrogen ions from the tubular lumen. If hydrogen ions accumulate, then the activity of the sodium hydrogen exchanger is slow. Carbonic anhydrase facilitates the removal of the luminal hydrogen ions by promoting the dissociation of carbonic acid, which is H2CO3, formed by the association of filtered bicarbonate with the hydrogen ion secreted into the tubular lumen by the sodium hydrogen exchanger to yield carbon dioxide in water. This process of carbonic acid formation and dissociation maintains a low luminal hydrogen ion level and thus allows the sodium hydrogen exchanger to continue to reabsorb sodium. If carbonic anhydrase is inhibited, luminal hydrogen ion concentrations rise and the activity of the sodium hydrogen exchanger is inhibited. The carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are relatively weak diuretics because of the ability of more distal sites to increase their reabsorption of sodium. An important consequence of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors is its interference with bicarbonate reabsorption. The distal tubules, distal nephron sites are not able to reclaim all of the additional car bicarbonate as a result, bicarbonate is lost in the urine. This loss of bicarbonate can be, can be an advantage in the treatment of individuals with severe metabolic alkalosis, in whom these bi this bicarbonate loss can limit alkalemia. However, loss of urinary bicarbonate can also lead to severe metabolic acidosis. So what about um, the potassium sparing diuretics? Um, they're sodium channel blockers in that the collecting duct plays a major role in the day-to-day -day regulation of sodium chloride and potassium secretion, excretion. Sodium reabsorption along this segment, which resorbs only 3 to 5 percent of filtered sodium, occurs via the luminal sodium channel. The reabsorption of sodium generates a voltage gradient that 
drives the potassium from the tubular cell into the tubular lumen and then into the urine. Blocking of the sodium reabsorption at this site, site slows potassium excretion and leads to the potassium retention for which other diuretics, um, for which diuretics that act on this segment are named. The net diuretic effect is approximately 1 to 2 percent filtered sodium. These diuretics are commonly paired with loop or thiazide um, for refractory edema or to blunt the potassium loss. So again, um, these sodium channel blockers, they block the re sodium reabsorption, thus slowing the potassium excretion and leading uh, to potassium retention. We also have the aldosterone antagonists. Um, this includes a spi spirolactone, um, which is most commonly used. The tubular epithelial cells in the collecting duct possess high affinity receptors for the hormone aldosterone. Occupancy of these receptors by aldosterone initiates a number of events, including activation of previously inactive luminal so sodium channels transport of additional sodium channels from the cytosol to the luminal cell main membrane and stimulation of the production of other sodium channels. Spirolactone competitively, competitively inhibits the aldosterone receptor. The net diuretic effect of the aldosterone antagonists is approximately 1 to 2 percent of filtered sodium. However, these drugs are particularly useful in the treatment of cirrhosis and ascites and have been shown to improve survival in patients with advanced heart failure. So what do we need to tell, uh, think about um, when we're thinking about prescribing diuretics? An important um, factor in diuretic efficacy is the patient's ability to adhere to a low-sodium so diet. As drug concentrations fall, a period of positive sodium balance, um, called the period of post-diuretic sodium retention, um, may follow. If dietary salt intake is high, then the amount of sodium lost in response to the diuretic may be partially or completely offset by post-diuretic sodium retention. The loop diuretics, the thiazide diuretics, um, and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are sulfamides, derivatives, and the provider should play, pay close attention to the specific reaction of a patient who reports an allergy um, to sulfa drugs, such as Bactrim or Septra. Because these in individuals with sulfa, sulfa allergies often have a predisposition to allergic reactions in general, as opposed to cross-reactivity with sulfamide drugs. The non-sulfamide loop diuretic um, is reserved for patients who develop a true allergic reaction to loop thiazide diuretics. As with any medication, it's important for the clinician to determine the patient's previous response to treatment and history of any adverse events, and additional considerations include costs, mobility, and toileting concerns that may affect the patient's adherence to prescribe diuretic therapy. Renal function is another important variable in determining the uh, diuretic response. Patients become less responsive to diuretics as renal failure declines. Loop diuretics typically retain effi efficacy even in the face of moderately severe renal insufficiency. However, patients may require higher di diuretic doses um, to achieve an effect. Most thiazides are relatively ineffective in individuals with uh, GFRs less than 30 milliliters per minute. Exceptions to this are the metal, metal zone um, and in the panamide. Potassium sparing diuretics should be used with great caution or should be avoided in patients with renal insufficiency because of the 
the potential um, to induce life-threatening uh, hypercalcemia. Uh, I'm sorry, hyperkalemia. In addition, um, length of time on therapy may contribute significantly to the responsiveness of kidneys um, to diuretics. The ability of a diuretic to increase renal uh, sodium chloride excretion declines over time, and this phenomenon, no referred to as diuretic resistance, is thought to occur in one in every three patients with heart failure. A second drug that is added may act synergistically um, to mitigate this adaptive process. We see this often in patients um, with chronic um, Lasix. We usually have to increase the dose while in the hospital if um, they have fluid retention or um, CHF because they have this diuretic resistance. For diuretic resistance, you need to evaluate and treat these factors, um, such as patient non-adherence, either not taking the drug or high sodium chloride intakes, heart failure, renal failure, increased renal insufficiency, nephrotic syndrome, and cirrhosis. Drugs that may cause diuretic resistance include the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories, captopril, cimetidine, and some of the antihypertensives. Um, for the thiazides, the m they are the most frequently used and least expensive antihypertensive drug. Early studies clearly demonstrate blood pressure reduction. However, metabolic effects such as hypokalemia, hyperuricemia, and hyperglycemia has been seen. Even more important, demonstration of significant reduction in coronary events following blood pressure reduction was difficult, um, and this limited their widespread use. Thiazide diuretics um, should be given as an initial treatment of hypertension unless specific indication for a drug from another class is noted. Um, and in addition of the thiazide to a loop diuretic and sodium restriction may be useful. especially in the treatment of refractory edema in patients with CHF, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, and renal failure. The rationale for this combination involves inhibition of sodium reabsorption at multiple sites along the nephron and the fact that, CHF, that in CHF most patients have altered creatinine clearance, so loop diuretics are more effective. Thiazides are also useful in reducing the frequency of uh, new stone formation in patients with idiopathic hypercalciuria um, because of their ability to decrease renal calcium excretion. This reduced calcium excretion results in a positive calcium balance that may reduce the number of fractures in older people. The same is not true of loop diuretics because these drugs produce a negative cal calcium balance and have been shown to increase the risk of hip fractures um, associated with osteoporosis. Thiazide, thiazides may also um, be used to decrease urine volume in patients with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Thiazide diuretics given in combination with low-salt diet in the management of Meniere's disease may decrease the natural progression of sensorineural hearing loss and may be used to treat vertigo um, through prevention of flare-ups. As in the case with most of the diuretics, major complications of thiazide therapy include fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. So for um, treatment principles, as a general recommendation, thiazide should be started at the lowest dose, and those with shorter half-life should be given once or twice daily. Doses no greater than 25 milligrams daily of hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone should be given uh, for the treatment of hypertension. The adverse effects of hypokalemia, hypomagnesium, magnesium, 
and increased cholesterol, as well as the possible increase of s in sudden death among thiazide-treated patients, appear to be dose-related. Except in patients with renal insufficiency um, with a GFR less than 30, thiazide diuretics are more efficacy for than loop diuretics for the treatment of hypertension. It's believed that sodium retention is activated by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system once the loop diuretic response has dissipated. Um, less than six hours for uh, LASIX. six. It's it is not known whether a tero terosamide, which lasts up to twelve hours, would be effective. Loop diuretics are also effective um, for the removal of excess fluid in ascites, ascites and chronic kidney disease. In patients with normal kidney function, the maximum effective dose in, for cirrhosis is 40 milligrams, 1 milligram, and 20 milligrams of uh, furosemide, butanamide, and terosamide, respectively. Doses are higher in the treatment of nephrotic syndrome. Um, where 120 milligrams of furosemide is given 3 milligrams of butanamide and 50 milligrams of terosamide. The major toxicities related to loop diuretics result um, from their ability to induce fluid and electrolyte imbalances hypersensitivity reactions, and ototoxicity. These fluid and electrolyte imbalances arise from excessive diuresis and occurs as hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesium, hypocalcemia, hyperuricemia, metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, and elevations in BUN and serum creatinine. Excessive sodium and water losses may lead to volume depletion and hypotension. Ototoxicity um, generally manifests as a deafness and sometimes can be permanent. It's been reported in the treatment um, of acute renal failure with doses of Lasix greater than 80 to 160 milligrams per hour or 2 to 4 grams per day. Concurrent use of aminoglucoside antibiotics and loop diuretics increase this risk of um, deafness. So the primary use of loop diuretics involves the treatment of states of volume excess that includes CHF, nephrotic syndrome, acute and chronic renal insufficiency, and cirrhosis. Furosemide is, most commonly, is the most commonly used diuretic. Terosamide and butanamide offer enhanced absorption over um, Lasix and in some cases may provide greater efficacy in patients who do not respond to the maximum dose of furosemide. A critical component of the loop diuretic dosing is the equivalent dose of each drug. Uh, furosemide, 40 milligrams, is equivalent to 1 milligram of butamide and 20 milligrams of torosamide. This is important when the change is made from one loop diuretic to another. Diuresis is seen with a dose of 10 milligrams of furosemide and at 40 milligrams in patients with normal renal function. The equivalent dosages um, of butanamide and terosamide are 1 milligram and 20 milligrams. Loop diuretics are also effective in the removal of excess fluid in ascites and chronic kidney disease. In patients with normal kidney function, the maximum effective dose in the treatment of cirrhosis is 40 milligrams of furosemide, 1 milligram of butanamide, and 20 milligrams of torosamide. Doses are higher in the treatment of nephrotic syndrome, where 100 millig 120 milligrams of furosemide, 3 milligrams of butanamide, and 50 milligrams um, of terosamide is are used. In the treatment of patients with heart failure, loop diuretics relieve um, congestive symptoms of pulmonary and peripheral edema. Symptom relief is felt within hours to days in contrast to the other treatments 
um, for heart failure such as ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and digoxin. Those may take weeks to months to provide maximum benefit. A typical starting dose of furosemide is 20 to 40 milligrams for bu butamide is 0.5 to 1 milligram and terosemide 10 to 20 milligrams. Dosing is guided by the diuretic response and dose should be increased every one to two weeks um, because net sodium loss occurs for only one to two weeks before a new steady state is achieved. A helpful monitoring tool involves asking the patient to record his or her weight daily if the patient does not respond, the clinician can increase the diuretic dose initially rather than giving the same dose twice a day. Maximum daily doses in patients with normal renal function are 80 milligrams for furosemide, 3 milligrams for butanamide, and 50 milligrams for terosemide. Higher total doses of up to 200 milligrams of Lasix given as split doses may be necessary in patients with renal insufficiency. It's very important to adequately dose the loop diuretics because the accuracy of dosing affects the efficacy of other therapies for heart failure, such as the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, and the beta blockers. The major toxicities related to loop diuretics result from their, inabil for the, from their ability to induce fluid and electrolyte imbalances, hypersensitivity reactions, and ototoxicity. These fluid and electrolyte imbalance arise from, arise from excessive diuresis and occur as hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesia, and hypocalcemia. They, you can also result in hyperuricemia, metabolic acidosis, and elevations in BUN and serum creatinine. Excessive sodium and water losses may lead to volume depletion and hypotension. Ototoxicity generally manifests itself as deafness and sometimes is permanent. It's been reported in the treatment of acute renal failure with doses of greater than 80 to 160 milligrams per hour of um, furosemide. Concurrent use of aminoglucoside antibiotics and loop diuretics also increase this risk of deafness. Um, remember hypersensitivity reaction, sulfamide derivatives, um, especially be careful with the sulfur allergies. Um, Non-sulfamide loop diuretics um, is reserved for those who have a true allergic reaction to a loop or thiazide diuretic. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are relatively weak diuretics. Um, they are used primarily in the treatment of patients with open angle glaucoma and for prophylaxis and treatment of acute mountain sickness. The risk of mountain sickness is directly related to the rate of ascent. Um, anything above 4,000 meters um, with ascent rates greater than 500 uh, meters per day, um, these medications can be used. They may be used in combination with other diuretics to treat edema associated with heart failure. The ability of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to increase urinary losses of bicarbonate may be useful in the treatment of individuals with severe metabolic alkalosis. For the potassium sparing diuretics, these are generally used in combination with the thiazides. The rationale for the combination is to augment diuresis and blunt the hypokalemia that is seen with the use of thiazide and loop diuretics. Spirolactone, a nonspecific aldosterone antagonist, has been shown to be of particular benefit in the treatment of severe CHF when added to an ACE inhibitor and a loop diuretic um, for severe CHF, uh, reducing the mortality rates. Hyperkalemia appears to be dose dependent. Uh, Alphernon is an aldosterone specific antagonist designed to minimize the unpleasant endocrine side effects of spirolactone. 
It is effective in the treatment of heart failure in post-MI patients and may cause relevant increases in potassium levels greater than 6 milliequivalents per liter. Um, renal function and potassium levels should be followed closely with this medication, usually one week and one month after dosage adjustments are made. Patients um, who who should not receive aldosterone antagonists for the treatment of heart failure are those with baseline plasma creatinine concentrations greater than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter um, in males and 2 milligrams per deciliter in females, and those with potassium concentrations greater than 5. Guidelines on ST segment elevation MI also recommend uh, the use of spirolactone and L in patients who are already receiving ACE inhibitors, exhibiting an L, uh, LVEF of 40% and presenting with symptomatic heart failure or diabetes. Osmotic diuretics such as mannitol act by inhibiting sodium absorption in the proximal tubule of the loop of Henle. Their clinical use is limited primarily to inpatient settings in which they may be used to reduce intracranial pressure or to reduce intraocular pressure in glaucoma. Osmotic diuretics are not used in edematous states or in outpatients because of their potential to induce intravascular volume expansion as and pulmonary edema in susceptible patients. Um, finally, the combination diuretics. Uh, diuretic combinations are used um, to minimize the side effects of one diuretic by using lower doses and to increase urinary sodium losses by blocking sodium reabsorption at two sites along the nephron. Most often, a potassium sparing diuretic will be used with thiazide diuretics to minimize the risk of hypokalemia. Another combination consists of a loop diuretic and a thiazide to affect diuresis in individuals with resistance to the effects of loop diuretics used alone. The simultaneous use of two diuretics of the same class, um, such as two loop diuretics or two, two thiazides, um, provides no additional therapeutic benefit over that provided by a single agent. Thus, um, these should never be prescribed. For com four combinations of diuretics, di thiazide and potassium sparing, loop and thiazide, loop and potassium sparing, and loop and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors may be prescribed together. Only thiazide and potassium sparing agents are available as a fixed dosage. The loop and uh, thiazide diuretics uh, patients may become resistant to the effects of diuretics during the treatment. Patients may tolerate these regimens better if a thiazide diuretic is administered every other day or only two or three times per week. The combination of loop and potassium smear and diuretics is frequently used in patients um, with decompensated liver disease and ascites. These individuals typically have high aldosterone levels. As a result, they maximally conserve sodium in their collecting duct. The addition of spirolactone is more efficacy, efficacious um, than either agent given independently. A typical starting combination of these drugs in patients without hypertension um, or CHF is 40 milligrams of furosemide with 100 milligrams of spirolactone. Amyloride, uh, which also acts in the collecting duct, may be used um, instead of the spirolactone. Its onset of action is faster, and it is, its use does not lead to complications of gynecomastia, which may be associated with spirolactone. The combination of loop and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors during loop diuretic therapy, two factors make the addition of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor useful. The first is that the loop diuretic induced volume loss stimulates increased absorption of sodium in the proximal tubule. This increased proximal reabsorption of sodium may blunt the efficacy of the loop diuretic. Um, 
Second, loop diuretics increase urinary losses of hydrogen ions, and this may contribute to the development of metabolic alkalosis. The addition of carbonic anhydrase inhibitor may enhance urinary sodium loss and prevent or maximize the development of metabolic alkalosis. The combination of loop diuretic and carbonic anhydrase inhibitor should be given with caution, however. Hypovolemia, hypokalemia, and metabolic acidosis are potential complications of the combined therapy. The healthcare provider should have a clear understanding of the patient's acid base status before using a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Um, for example, if the patient's serum, serum bicarbonate is elevated as an appropriate response to acute or chronic respiratory acidosis, then the addition of carbonic anhydrase inhibitor could lead to severe acid, acid um, metabolic acidosis. A full, um, and caution needs to be um, made when combining the two. So how do you monitor these drugs? Um, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities are the most common adverse effects of diuretic uses. Up to 50% of patients receiving diuretic therapy with loop diuretics experience potassium levels lower than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, recent data on the mortality benefits of aldosterone and antagonists in heart failure have l has led to an increase in the incidence of hyperkalemia. Um, following a publication of the RALES, R-A-L-E-S trial, uh, significant increases um, from 4 to 11 per 1,000 patients occurred during the treatment period in rates of hospital admissions for hyperkalemia. Rates of hyperkalemia-related deaths increased from 0.7 to 2 per 1,000. Patients who have higher baseline plasma potassium concentrations should not be started on aldosterone antagonist. Studies have identified that patients prescribed spirolactone usually have one or more um, risk factors um, for the development of spirolactone-induced hyperkalemia and requires strict and careful monitoring. These risk factors include um, increased age, more severe heart failure, diabetes, pre-existing renal dysfunction or altered creatinine clearance, volume depletion, spiral lactone doses greater than 50 milligrams per day, higher dose ACE inhibitors or ARB, combined use of ACE inhibitors and ARB, um, beta blocker use, the use of potassium supplements or potassium containing salt substitutes, um, or the use of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Volume status should also be addressed at baseline and periodically during therapy. Patients can be instructed to record their weight and the amount of edema on a daily basis at home. Um, major changes in electrolytes generally occur within the first few weeks of therapy, and contrary to popular belief, potassium depletion is not progressive with continued treatment. Serum electrolyte should be checked before diuretic tr therapy is initiated after one week and one month of starting therapy, after any dose changes, and at other times other thereafter as warranted by changes in the patient's clinical condition. To prevent significant cardiovascular events such, such as fatal dysrhythmias, supplementation with magnesium as well as potassium um, may have to be considered in some patients. Um, for patient education, uh, you need to stress the importance of dietary sodium restriction in determining diuretic efficacy. Um, you need to explain the symptoms of hypovolemia, including weakness and orthostatic dizziness that may indicate that the need um, for diuretic dose adjustment the signs and symptom, symptoms of hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, including profound weakness. Um, patients should report these symptoms immediately so that electrolytes may be checked. You need to stress the um, need for adherence with intermittent dosage schedules, such as alternative day or weekly dosing. 
It may improve if patients um, use a calendar to record the medication use. Um, patients may wish to avoid taking their diuretics late in the day to minimize disturbances in sleep patterns. For example, furosemide should not be given um, less than six hours um, prior to bedtime. Urinary volume is expected to increase, therefore easy access to the bathroom is essential, especially at the initiation of drug therapy. For some patients, this effect does not improve over time. This is especially important with the elderly um, who often get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and fall. You may need to monitor daily weights. Um, rapid weight losses, more than one to two pounds per day, may be harmful to your patient. For geriatrics, um, older patients are at increased risk for diuretic-induced electrolyte disturbances caused by age-related decline in renal function. This fall in GFR diminishes the diuretic response, in particular to the thiazides. Despite this fact, isolated systolic hypertension in some conditions may be successfully treated with low-dose diuretic monotherapy in the elderly. Um, this, um, there was a large study done um, in the 90s on systolic hypertension in the elderly um, program. It's called the SHEP trial. This trial demonstrated that um, chlorothiazide 12.5 to 25 milligrams per day, per daily, um, reduced blood pressure. The incidence of stroke at four to five years was 5.2% compared with 8.2% in the placebo group. The incidence of cardiac events was reduced by one quarter to one third, although this reduction was not statistically significant. Benefits were seen in all age groups, including patients older than 80 years and in both men and women. For pediatric patients, um, considerable, da considerable data has supported the safety and efficacy of thiazide diuretics in children. In clinical practice, however, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and beta blockers are used preferably over thiazide diuretics because of the potential for glucose elevation and lipid and electrolyte abnormalities. Um, it's used um, in the pediatric population for edema, glaucoma, and epilepsy. Um, acetazolamide is used for glaucoma and epi um, for glaucoma and epilepsy only. Butanamide and erythrocyanic acid are not recommended in children younger than 18 years of age. Ferrosamide should be avoided in the premature infant with respiratory distress syndrome because it may increase the risk of persistent patent ductus arteriosus and ototoxicity. Chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, spiro spirolactone, and hydrochlorothiazide and spirolactone have been safely used in pediatric patients for the treatment of edema and hypertension. Careful, careful monitoring is essential because the pediatric patient may be less tolerant of uh, small shifts in fluids and electrolytes. Subtle changes related to diuretic or potassium replacement therapies may not manifest itself um, in pediatric patients as they do in adults. Infants especially cannot report symptoms related to weakness, confusion, paresthesia, or muscle cramps. Changes in personality and in eating or sleeping patterns, as well as restlessness, should be reported and investigated promptly. F for pregnancy and lactation, um, it's considered category C. There's a great variability in the safety of diuretics in pregnancy. Race and gender, race can be a factor when diuretic therapy is considered. In the treatment of hypertension, African Americans often respond better than whites to the monotherapy diuretics.